Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Emmanuel Favalora, a principal hospital scientist in haematology at New South Wales Health Pathology, as based at Westmead Hospital. It is an honour to be sharing to be chairing this session, and I've known my our international plenary speaker for quite a while. This is our second plenary session of today, um, and it's been given by Professor um, Giuseppe Lippi, who's a full professor in clinical biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of Verona in Italy. Uh, he's a director of laboratory service at the University Hospital of Verona in Italy and president of the Medical School of Verona University. And president in Italy is the same as Dean here. He has published over 2,000 articles in peer review journals. His total impact factor is a staggering 14, about 14,000, and his H index is 121. He has participated in more than 600 national and international congresses and given more than 300 lectures uh, to national and international meeting. He currently chairs the task force on COVID-19 of the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine, or the IFCC, and he's here today to talk about COVID-19 beyond virology. I'm very pleased to present to you today, Professor Giuseppe Lippi. Over to you, Giuseppe. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. C can you see my slides and can you hear me? We can hear you. I can't see your slides yet, but I think they'll come up in a second. Please tell me when you see my slides. So now, no slides on, on your screen? No, no, your, sli your slides are up. Just say, be ah, okay, present. perfect. Okay, thank all you right. so much. Uh, somebody turn my mic off. Fantastic. So, first of all, let me thank you, the organizer of this nice meeting, and especially Dr. Emanuel Favaloro for inviting me to deliver this webinar on coronavirus disease 2019. Before specifically addressing the main topic of this presentation, let me briefly introduce some aspect of this novel pandemic disease. Coronavirus diseases are not obviously new viruses for humanity, since COVID-19 is only the third coronavirus outbreak that has occurred over the past 20 years, following several acute respiratory syndrome in 2002 and 2003, and Middle East respiratory syndrome in 2012. The most relevant difference is that the two former outbreaks have caused less than 2,000 deaths altogether, while COVID-19 has already affected nearly 630 million people worldwide, causing 6.6 million casualty as for today. This number remains far below the over 50 million deaths occurred during the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918 and 1919, but classifies COVID-19 as the seventh more deadly infectious disease throughout the human history. As concerns the responsible pathogen, the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses has concluded that the microorganism causing COVID-19 is a beta coronavirus belonging to the same family of viruses that may cause flu-like syndromes and common colds, and that has been finally called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, which is abbreviated to SARS-CoV-2. Few words on the pathogenesis of COVID-19. I would like to start with the words of this editorial, affirming that the most astonishing thing about pandemic is its mystery, since nobody knew what it was, where it came from, and what to do for stopping it. The funny thing is that this editorial was published in Science one century ago, and it dealt with the Spanish influenza pandemic. As in the Stephen King's movie, referring in such case to viral pandemics, sometimes they come back. And when this happens, it is never a good thing for mankind. The leading pathogenetic aspects of COVID-19 are summarized in this figure. What we have learned so far is that COVID-19 is not a clear-cut disorder, but is a gradually evolving pathology characterized by a series of stages sustained by different molecular and biological mechanisms. The disease can be basically divided in five different phases as shown in the figure. While remain asymptomatic or only mildly symptomatic in the vast majority of subjects, especially with the new Omicron variants, in 30% of patients, especially those who refuse to be vaccinated or are fragile, 
the illness may progress towards a respiratory phase with a severe form of interstitial pneumonia. An abnormal, almost exaggerated immune response occurring in some patients then justifies the progression toward a third phase that you can see in this part of the slide <coughs> that is characterized with lung and systemic hyperinflammation and onset of several systemic symptoms due to progressive evolution towards lung and multiple organ injury. In a percentage variable between 2 and 5% of all these patients, the disease may then progress into a four mostly critical phase where hyperinflammation triggers hemostasis activation, which then leads to generation of intra and extravascular coagulopathies, which may foster deterioration and death in the final stage of disease. It is rather clear from this clinical picture that patient treatment must be specifically tailored according to stage or severity of disease, since some therapies that would work in the early phase may be lately ineffective and obviously vice versa. Therefore, this infectious disease extends far beyond causing lung injury as for the title of my presentation, but generates dramatic damages to many organs and tissues, including the heart and blood vessels, the central nervous system, the kidneys, the liver, the gastrointestinal system, as well as the eyes and the olfactory and gustatory systems. As anticipated in one of the previous slides, the convergence of many pathogenetic mechanisms leading to hemostasis activation and fibrinolysis inhibition translates into a remarkable number of thrombotic episodes. As concerned all COVID-19 patients, thus including those with mild, moderate, and severe illness, this Cochrane Systematic Literature Review found that the overall incidence of venous thromboembolism can be as high as, uh, as, high as 7.4%, 7, 7 with that of deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and systemic coagulopathy being as high as 6.1%, 4.3%, and 8%. Interestingly, in this further analysis, the development of these cardiovascular events was not found to be linear over time, with peaks found between minus five to seven days from COVID-19 diagnosis. Yet, the risk of pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis remained considerably high up to two months after recovery, as you will see in this part of the slide. It is also important to highlight that the increased burden of pulmonary thrombosis in patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection is attributable to a notable extent of in situ thrombosis, as clearly shown in this investigation, where 70% of all patients with COVID-19 had only thrombosis evidences in segmental or subsegmental arteries. The evidence that in situ pulmonary thrombosis may be the hallmark of COVID-19, as well as probably many other infectious diseases like Ebola, has also emerged from this Italian study, where it was confirmed that the caliber of pulmonary segmental and subsegmental vessels is enlarged in patients with COVID-19. This evidence paves the way to the clear-cut concept that the pulmonary thrombosis seen in patients with COVID-19 is only partially attributable to pulmonary embolism deriving from peripheral thrombotic sites, while a, larger, a large number of patients develop in situ pulmonary thrombosis. Some words on the most important risk factor that may influence unfavorable disease progression and outcome. The first and most obvious demographic characteristic that may influence disease progression are age and sex, as for most other infectious diseases where fragile persons are at higher risk of unfavorable progression. As clearly shown in this analysis of Italian COVID-19 deaths published by our National Institute of Health, men accounted for nearly 60% of all deaths and over 95% were aged 60 years or older. Whether the higher mortality in men depends on a higher prevalence of comorbidity is an aspect that indeed shall be considered. Cumulative Italian data suggests that the data rate in people without a single comorbidity is only around 3%, but then increases exponentially in those with one, two, and three comorbidities 
there seems thus to exist a very strict relationship between the number of pathologies in COVID-19 patients and their risk to develop severe or critical forms of disease. Notably, the most frequent comorbidities in patients dying with COVID-19 are hypertension, and this probably relates to the fact that angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is the natural cell receptor of SARS-CoV-2, and then is followed by obesity, metabolic disturbances, especially diabetes, chronic lung pathologies, cardiovascular diseases, renal and gastrointestinal disorders, among the others. It is also interesting that vaccinated patients dying for COVID-19 have a nearly five-fold higher likelihood of having comorbidities, meaning that concomitant pathologies may also play a substantial role in influencing disease progression even after vaccination. The data published by the U.S. Center for Disease and Control and Prevention, CDC, are virtually overlapping with those published in Italy. This specific analysis revealed a considerable high prevalence of cardiovascular disease, around 61%, diabetes, nearly 40%, chronic kidney disease and lung diseases, both around 20%, as well as with a lower prevalence of neurological condition that may influence patient outcome. The concept that the presence of comorbidities would significantly influence the clinical course of disease is also reflected by the results of this recent meta-analysis, showing that different pathologies such as hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic obstetric pulmonary disease, chronic kidney disease, and cancer may drive COVID-19 towards a more severe illness and even to death. Another important aspect that has recently emerged and which is now gaining momentum is that genetic polymorphisms in both the virus, especially in the receptor binding domain of its spike protein, and in its host receptors may play a role in influencing virulence and as well pathogenicity. The hypothesis that polymorphisms in the natural SARS-CoV-2 host receptor, that is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, may play a role in influencing the clinical course of COVID-19 is now clear, since mutation in this protein have been described that might ultimately contribute to modify the intramolecular interaction and so the binding between the virus and its receptor. Even more importantly, some of this mutation may also concur to modulate the pulmonary and systemic injury that is commonly seen in COVID-19 patients with critical illness by fostering vasoconstriction, inflammation, oxidation, and lastly, fibrosis. The complexity of the genomic regulation of SARS-CoV-2 infection and severity has further been highlighted in this work, where a vast array of host cellular pathways were found to be involved at variable extent, including cell penetration, platelet transport, cell cycle regulation, transcriptional and epigenetic regulation, along with inflammation signaling. As concerned viral genetics, little doubts remain that SARS-CoV-2 has undergone a considerable number of mutations since its earlier appearance in Wuhan in 2019, and will continue to do so until it will remain among us, maybe forever. This is not surprising since viruses which directly encode their genome in RNA, so also including HIV and influenza viruses, insert mutation in their RNA very rapidly. And this is due to the fact that these microorganisms reproduce inside their hosts, where enzymes coping RNA are vulnerable to errors. This interesting work, for example, has estimated that nearly 12 new mutations may appear every day in the receptor binding domain of the virus, and that the number of variants may end double every three months. The current scenario is reproducing this figure with nearly 3,000 descendants from the prototype strain first detected in Wuhan. In the right part of, of this phylogeny, up here, you can see clearly the emergence of the first Omicron strain, which was first identified in South Africa at the end of November 2021. An updated figure on the current epidemiological situation in terms of SARS-CoV-2 variant of concern in Europe is regularly provided by the ECDC, which shows that not the most large, the now the most largely frequent lineage is Omicron BA45, 
followed by Omicron BA275, whose diffusion in the continent is, however, still limited. Similar statistics are also available in the CDC website, which also shows that in the US, BA4 and BA5 are currently the most frequent variants of concern sequences in the country, with a trend towards increase of the new Omicron sublineages, such as BQ1.1. One aspect that must be clearly recognized is that the term Omicron is a generic name which identifies a number of different lineages, each differing for number and types of mutation. So far, the BA5 sublineage has become BA5, sorry, sublineage has become prevalent in most countries worldwide due to its high infectivity. Particular concern has been recently raised by two new Omicron sublineages. The DQ1.1, also called Cerberus, which has three more mutations in the spike protein compared to the BA5 sublineage, and the XBB variant, which is a recombinant variant displaying 14 additional mutations in the spike protein compared to BA2, which is the ancestral variant. As concerned the incubation time, the different sars of 2 lineages that have progressively appeared since the 2019 have displayed heterogeneous biological characteristics, including a potentially different time of incubation. In particular, it seems especially evident that the incubation time has gradually shortened over time, from around five days with the ancestral strain to around three days with the new Omicron sublineages. Incidentally, I was infected by this variant during a dinner at, an, at our national meeting of the Italian Society of Laboratory Medicine one month ago, and my symptom appeared exactly 72 hours after I was in close contact with a positive person. In line with a number of other concomitant reports, we have found that infection by Omicron are more frequently associated with upper respiratory symptoms, mirroring those of common cold and flu, accompanied by a considerable lower number of uh, cases of shortness of breath, which could hence suggest that a less severe involvement of le the lower respiratory tract may occur in patients with Omicron infection. I can confirm this conclusion since my symptomatology was that of an upper respiratory infection with very mild fever and prevalently cold and headache, completely resolved in two to three days. In a technical briefing of the UK Health Security Agency, it has also been reported that the spread of the Omicron variant has been associated with milder symptoms, more closely mimicking an upper respiratory tract infection and encompassing sore throat and cough, while several symptoms like dyspnea seem to be underrepresented, along with loss of smell and taste, which have been for long paradigmatic symptoms of SARS-CoV-2 infection. <coughs> <clears throat> As then concerned viral clearance, this study showed that the kinetics of negativization of viral culture seems slightly faster in subjects infected by Omicron compared, for example, to those infected by the former Delta variant. These kinetics are some obvious consequences when taking decision on the length of isolation and quarantine of infected people, since the risk of being infectious and thereby of infecting other people linearly decreases over time, becoming only around 1% after 14 days. Regarding the clinical impact of the Omicron sublineages, the mounting biological data that tend to classify Omicron as a less pathogenetic variant are mirrored by real-world epidemiological evidence. This South African study, for example, reported that the risk of needing oxygen therapy mechanical ventilation, intensive care, as well as the overall risk of death is substantially lower compared, for example, to that seen with the former Delta variant in yellow in this slide. Similar conclusions can be made analyzing Italian data, where it was shown that the burden of symptomatic infections needing hospitalization or intensive care unit admission was nearly 70% lower in the Omicron compared to the alpha variant period. As concerned the clinical outcome of infection by the different Omicron lineages, 
This preliminary study confirmed that all Omicron variants, thus including the currently endemic BA5 in Italy and in several other countries, have similar clinical severity. This following Danish nationwide study found is that, that although the hospitalization rate due to COVID-19 remained very low throughout the Omicron sublineages predominant periods, it seemed to have become a bit higher in subjects with BA5 infection compared to those infected by BA2, both vaccinated and unvaccinated. An important aspect that needs to be highlighted is that the lower pathogenicity of the Omicron variants is compounded by a considerable increase of evasion from the immune response of people vaccinated with the original vaccine formulations or infected by previous variants. We have full available data on this matter, and we have finally showed that, on average, the neutralization activity of uh, currently available monovalent vaccines is reduced by approximately 50% against the Omicron sublineages. Besides confirming that vaccine elicited neutralization against the Omicron variants is reduced, this study failed to find substantial differences among the different Omicron sublineages. Notably, the study also confirmed that the vaccine booster is indeed effective to restore a sufficient level of neutralization against these new highly mutated variants. Despite the reliable evidence portrays a remarkable impairment of humoral immunity against highly mutated SARS-CoV-2 lineages such as those of the Omicron family, Confirmed data have instead emerged from studies of immunological memory and cellular immunity, whereby effective anti Omicron memory B cells would seem to persist for six months after vaccination, while medium term T cell immunity seems only marginally impaired by these lineages. This would ultimately contribute to explain why people may be frequently reinfected by highly mutated SARS CoV 2 variant strains like Omicron. And this is probably due to impaired antibodies mediated neutralization, but tend to only develop mild symptoms, since cellular immunity is almost completely preserved. What can be thus finally preferred about Omicron lineages is that the humoral immunity seems to be less efficient against these variants, and thereby the risk of infection rises. However, cellular immunity still works very properly so that you will get the infection, but you are unlikely to become severely healed. A few words on the new bivalent COVID-19 vaccine that have now been administered throughout the world, as well in, in my country. The results of this phase 2-3 two, two, trial with the Pfizer Biotech bivalent BA4-5 formulation are summarized in the figure, showing that this reformulated vaccine enhances neutralization against all Omicron strains compared to the original monovalent vaccine, and specifically neutralization seems to be increased by nearly three folds versus the BA4-5 lineages. Almost identical evidence has emerged from this phase two trial based on similar bivalent modern vaccine, which displays up to three-fold higher neutralization of the Omicron BA4-5 variant compared to the previous monovalent formulation. As then concerned, the role of laboratory medicine in stratifying the risk of developing severe disease or dying for SARS-CoV-2 infection, several lines of evidence now attest that a number of laboratory tests provide an essential contribution to the clinical decision-making and to the therapeutic monitoring of COVID-19 thus reaffirming the virtually irreplaceable role played by in vitro diagnostic testing in modern science and medicine. In this comprehensive earlier meta-analysis, for example, we have examined some basic laboratory tests that may provide clinically important information in the process of risk stratification of patients with COVID-19. Among others, Progression towards severe disease was found to be associated with higher values of hematological tests such as total leukocytes and neutrophils, higher concentration of tissue injury biomarkers, such as aminotransferases, total bilirubin, urea and creatinine, creatinine kinase, lactate dehydrogenase, myoglobin, and creatinine kinase isoenzyme MB, 
with increased values of hemostasis tests, such as prothrombin time and the dimer, but also with higher values of many inflammatory biomarkers, such as the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, C-reactive protein, ferritin, and various interleukin, such as el and procalcitonin. Unfavorable disease progression has also been associated with lymphopenia, eosinopenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia, as well as with lower values of albumin. The important evidence garnered so far from this and other subsequent meta-analyses has emphasized us to suggest a tentative minimal laboratory testing panel, which may be helpful to manage COVID-19 and which is now actually routinely used in many hospitals, including mines in Verona. One final aspect that needs to be addressed is the risk of developing medium and long-term consequences after recovering from COVID-19. Although it may be still early to draw definitive conclusions on this matter, preliminary evidence is seemingly demonstrating that the physiological and physical impact of SARS-CoV-2 infection may be relevant after recovery, affecting around one every eight patients who had recovered from a SARS-CoV-2 acute infection. The complex of the many and different consequences of COVID-19 on the medium and long term is conventionally known as long COVID. One reliable definition endorsed by a large panel of reward experts and also recently by the World Health Organization is that of a condition that develops usually three months after the onset of a previous history of confirmed or probable SARS-CoV-2 infection, characterized by persistence of symptoms for not less than two months and which may not be justified by an alternative diagnosis. The most frequent symptoms include, but are not limited to, fatigue, dyspnea, and cognitive dysfunction, usually the, the so-called uh, brain fog, usually causing unfavorable consequences on everyday functioning. Such symptoms may newly develop after early recovering from acute COVID-19 illness or could either persist from the initial illness. The potential mechanisms underlying this syndrome are multiple and multifaceted, but can typically be classified within three pathways encompassing immune dysregulation, autoimmunity, and viral persistence or inflammation within the organism. The kaleidoscope of potential health consequences of post-acute COVID-19 by organ system has been brilliantly summarized in these two articles, from which it can be acknowledged that side effects would not only be limited to the lung, but will involve a large number of organs and tissues, thus assuming the clinical phenotype of a clear extrapulmonary systemic long-term disorder. In this study, which assesses the persistence of COVID-19 disturbances after nearly two years, thus probably representing the longer follow-up study ever published so far, the prevalence of symptoms of long COVID was 38%, more frequently represented by fatigue, smell and test disturbances, along with concentration and consciousness impairment. One final aspect that deserves last attention for the future is the risk that the reverse transcribed RNA of SARS-CoV-2 could be somehow integrated within the genome of the infected individual, where it could remain stably, thus influencing the expression of human genes, but could also be actively re-expressed in human tissue and organ after some time, the consequences of which are for now totally unknown. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Giuseppe, for um, a, a, a actually a shorter talk than uh, we were expecting, but that's that's fine. We've got lots of time for questions. Um, so, uh, if anybody wishes to have uh, questions or, or pose some questions, please put them in your um, chat box or in the question and answer box. Um, in in the interim, I'm happy to ask a few questions and uh, progress the discussion. So uh, one of the first questions that I have is that although uh, COVID-19 uh, or, or SARS-2 infection is, COVID-2 infection is a 
viral disease, it's now clear that COVID-19 is, is primarily a prothrombotic disorder as well as, as obviously a uh, highly uh, high inflammatory state. Um, and even the symptomology around the infected uh, lungs uh, uh, leading to breathing you know, issues or bleeding problems is uh, likely at least partially thrombosis driven. Um, thus, it's clear uh, that in these patients, anticoagulation therapy uh, will play a role in treating or managing patients. Uh, and here, I think most of the data suggests that uh, heparin plays the major role. And heparin is one of those parental agents that uh, are given uh, typically by injection. Uh, but there is much confusion and debate around which heparin to use uh, and the strength and duration of heparin treatment. Uh, can you provide a few comments around that, Giuseppe? Yes, I, I forgot to mention during my introduction that uh, COVID-19 is probably the best example that we have had so far of a, 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 of a disease that needs a personalized approach. I mean, uh, there, are, there are a lot of words on personalized or precision medicine, you know, but probably uh, nothing like COVID-19 is the, the perfect target of personalized medicine. And this preamble is necessary because I don't have a definitive answer uh, to your question, of course, but uh, the, the anticoagulant therapy must be uh, um, tailored according to the individual risk of, of the patient. <coughs> so we, uh, we have probably learned uh, um, from, of course, from my presentation, but from the, the, the huge number of data that have been published so far, that the uh, clinical course of disease is strongly influenced by uh, a number of, uh, um, let me say, genetic, uh, environmental, and even, and even epigenetic factors. So estimating the individual risk of thrombosis is the basis for establishing which, which kind of therapy you must administer to the patient. That said, we can um, uh, roughly cluster the, the patient according to three categories of risk. Um, uh, mild patients, which are mostly outpatient, that are totally managed uh, uh, as outpatient at home and even without taking nothing. For instance, I, I just took two pills of uh, acetaminophen one day for my illnesses. And of course, in my condition, I would never have benefit from uh, uh, an, an anticoagulant therapy. Rather, this anticoagulant therapy would have probably represented a, a risk of bleeding for myself. So a patient managed at home with uh, mild therapy do not need any kind of uh, anticoagulant therapy. Then the situation changes when the patient uh, becomes an inpatient and needs to be hospitalized. And in such case, we can distinguish between the patient that need an aggressive therapy, and most of these patients are admitted to the uh, intensive care unit. And I would remember that intensive care unit admission is now rarely caused by the lung involvement, but rather, as you correctly said before in your introduction, is most likely triggered by the thromboinflammation that occurs after the acute infection. So in this case, uh, which is the, the, the extreme condition, the patient needed uh, really uh, an, an, an urgent care, this patient would, need, uh, would probably benefit from prophylactic or therapeutic uh, anticoagulation. Prophylactic, if they don't have evidence so far, of, um, of an acute uh, thrombosis, and then uh, the, the anticoagulant ther therapy must shift towards uh, prophylactic regimen as soon as some uh, evidence of thrombosis in situ pulmonary thrombosis rather than deep vein thrombosis or arterial thrombosis will, will emerge. The uh, main uh, doubts that remain is, is that about uh, uh, patients that are hospitalized but that don't need the urgent care. In this patient, uh, there, are, there has been a huge debate about using <coughs> prophylactic uh, or therapeutic anticoagulation. Uh, probably, as I said before, the, the best approach is uh, um, individualizing the risk. I mean, in uh, a patient in overweight with cancer, hypertension, and maybe diabetes would probably benefit from a more aggressive anticoagulant therapy. Rather than a, um, a, a normal body weight patient who has no comorbidity, who will probably benefit from prophylactic therapy or even no therapy, depending on the fact that he can move or not move from the bed. Uh, and, and this probably is the first uh, answer to your question. Uh, then about the type of heparin that can be administered. Uh, 
Even here, we have some controversial evidence. Uh, the final impression that we got from the scientific literature is that low molecular weight heparin is probably the treatment of choice for, um, for anticoagulating this, this type of patients, even though uh, I didn't send you the, the article because I, I just read it this morning when I woke up at half past four. Uh, there, there has been a very interesting trial uh, published with uh, Apixaban, which is a, a direct um, oral anticoagulant. Uh, which um, clinical performance were actually identical to those of low molecular weight heparin, but without uh, the risk, but with a lower risk of bleeding. So probably in the future, uh, the, 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 the use of low molecular weight heparin may be some, somehow replaced by uh, direct oral anticoagulants that we know are more comfortable for the patient and sometimes some even more um, comfortable to be used by the clinicians. Uh, thank you. So, but, but continuing on that, although, as you indicate, we can't really make generalizations, but um, one of the generalizations that have come out of the literature, at least in terms of opinion, is that patients who you've characterized uh, as the severest, uh, for example, that go into ICU, uh, tend to do uh, less well with uh, uh, with therapeutic heparin, for example, than with prophylactic heparin. Uh, whereas those who are less sick um, uh, tend to, uh, may do better with uh, therapeutic heparin than prophylactics. In other words, the milder patients uh, may be given more heparin more safely than the severer patients uh, who, as you indicated, um, and they will not be given uh, as much heparin, uh, or it's a higher dose of heparin, um, primarily because uh, it's not as a effective and it may increase their risk of bleeding. And one of the proposals then is that perhaps uh, once they're that ill and, and go to uh, ICU, that perhaps it's a bit too late to provide them with therapeutic heparin. Totally agree. And there has been a, a, a trial published just yesterday about nasal heparin. You know that we have been discussing a, a lot about nasal heparin because um, nasal heparin has two main advantages. The first one is obviously the anticoagulant properties, but would need to be administered at very high dose to, to reach, uh, let's say, a, a prophylactic or therapeutic level. But the other important function that heparin exerts on, uh, uh, on COVID-19 is that it binds the spike protein of the virus. And in such case, uh, the administration of heparin can displace the binding of the virus to its natural receptor, which is mostly angiotensin converting enzyme too. So uh, administering heparin by, uh, uh, by the nasal route would probably give two benefits, uh, but at least we, we are limited to just one, uh, one published study so far, which appeared, as I said before, yesterday. And so we need more and more, uh, more and more information about this uh, this possibility. But I, I would see that heparin therapy, nasal heparin, would be probably a, a good perspective for the future. Yes, uh, that, that that's actually uh, very interesting, and it also ties into uh, other uh, potential benefits of uh, heparin uh, that we can go on and discuss uh, for for a long, long time. But the nasal route through the nose uh, is potentially something that um, is actually it goes that even goes beyond COVID of course so it, it's useful potentially in, in COVID simply because uh, obviously that's uh, one of the infectious routes for, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus is through the nose and uh, and uh, if you have nasal uh, heparin in, uh, if you have nasal heparin uh, administration then that can reduce your uh, infection risk uh, but you know you could we could consider that in the future nasal heparin may actually be uh, useful for all sorts of reasons uh, and that we can uh, actually replace uh, injectable heparin with nasal heparin at, at some stage in our uh, in our career life uh, so it's something it's a space to look for it's a space to look out for so it's a it's 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 something that we uh, hope uh, will happen certainly in my, in my career lifetime um, there are a couple of uh, questions now so I'll share the questions from the uh, from the attendees. Um, so one question is, um, uh, what is your greatest learning from the recent pandemic? And I think we have lots of those. But what is your greatest learning from the recent pandemic? 
Well, the greatest learning is that the healthcare must be a priority for all governments worldwide. Because I think that even in, in, in Australia, as it happened in Italy, we found ourselves totally unprepared. Uh, especially because we had a huge number of tests to be performed. And I'm not, I'm not talking only about uh, uh, microbiology testing, uh, which means a diagnosis of, a, of an acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. But in, uh, in, in one of the two hospitals in Verona, the acute, uh, the, uh, the acute disease hospital, we had as many as 300 patients concomitantly admitted uh, during November 2020. And that disrupted not only the organization of the hospital, I remember that the second hospital of Verona has 1,000 beds, which means that 30% of the beds were actually occupied by uh, COVID-19 patients. But we also uh, had a tremendous pressure of, uh, uh, of testing, um, uh, of urgent testing in, in my laboratory. For instance, we had the need to, uh, to perform a huge number of D-dimers, a new, huge number of uh, hematological testing, of troponin for these patients that were mostly critical during the, let's say, let's call it second wave of the pandemic. And as I said before, our government has, uh, has made a huge number of cuts to our staff, to our resources, uh, economical and organizational and uh, of personnel. And, and when we needed to, to face this, this drama, we, we didn't have really the, the, the instruments, to, the tools to, uh, to face it properly. So uh, if, if I have to, to choose one lesson that we must learn, is that we must be proactive. I mean, we always need to have a plan B. Uh, and uh, it seems that most governments worldwide are not thinking about a plan B uh, when an emergency comes. And I'm not only referring to an emergency like a pandemic, but also, uh, let's say, um, a war or uh, uh, an environmental uh, situation like uh, eruption, Balkan eruptions, I mean, whatever. Thank you, Giuseppe. Um, I, I certainly, uh, we recognise here in uh, New South Wales, for example, we, we published a small uh, paper in, uh, in pathology, which showed that within New South Wales health pathology, uh, our D-dimer uh, testing during COVID-19 increased about tenfold. So about 10 times as many tests for D-dimer were performed uh, when we were at the peak of our COVID-19 uh, inpatient uh, than, uh, than prior to that. Um, I've been told that we can finish early and go to our um, closing um, session early. So uh, with that, uh, I would just like to thank uh, Giuseppe Lippi for giving up his time uh, from Italy across, across the world, across the other side of the world. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to have you join us, Giuseppe. Uh, and I'm happy now to join, to hand you over to our direct, our Clint, Director of Clinical Operations, Associate Professor Robert uh, Lindemann. Uh, so please join the closing remarks session uh, in the next uh, in the next minute or so. Uh, again, Professor Giuseppe Lippi, uh, thank you very much for your time and for getting up early. I know you started this morning at about 4:30 in the morning. So My thank pleasure. you uh, very much uh, again for uh, presenting. Thank you. I'll hand you over.